What's up? Good morning. We're so glad you're here. These storms have just wreaked havoc this morning. I know there's people without power this morning that could be watching on your cell phone because your power is out at your house. So you only have a limited amount of battery on that cell phone this morning. But hey, thanks for showing up today. If you would stand, we're going to sing a new song. It's called Take You at Your Word. So sing with us. Is a lamp unto my feet. Your way is the only way for me. It's a narrow road that leads to life. You don't want to be on it. It's a narrow road, but the mercy's wide. Cause you're good on your promise. the chaos fell in line and I know cause I've seen it in my life it's a narrow road that leads to life but I want to be on it
believe that this morning? I'm calling on the God of Jacob, whose love endures to generations. Oh, I know that you will keep your covenant. I'm calling on Give him a big shout, a big clap of praise in this place. We thank you, Lord, that you're faithful. You can be seated. Good morning. This is, my name is Nicolette, and this is my daughter, Nevaeh. And she is making the decision to get baptized and... I'm very proud of her as a young lady making this decision. It's an important decision and it's life-changing. And I just want her to know that I love her and I'm proud of her. Thank 
Okay, and if you can repeat after me, I believe, I believe that Jesus is the Christ. That Jesus is the Christ. The Son of the Living God. The Son of the Living God. And I accept Him. And I accept Him as my personal Lord and Savior. As my personal Lord, Lord and Savior. Okay, because of your confession, we're going to baptize you in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. second we're going to invite you to come and uh, just join us together as a church to take communion together each and every week we get to do that what an awesome um, joy that is uh, a gift that it is that we can come and we can remember what Jesus Christ did most of you know this week was the national uh, day of prayer on Thursday so I hope that you spend some time on that day and every day uh, just praying for where our country's at, but praying for our leaders, praying for our pastor, those that lead us in all aspects of life. Amen. People in our schools. Um, Second Chronicles says that when Solomon was dedicating the temple to the Lord, the Lord spoke to Solomon. He said, if my people who are called by my name would humble themselves and pray he said then I will hear from heaven so we know that God's faithful to hear amen to f hear from heaven and that I would heal your land and I would forgive your sin so as you come today and you get those elements just hold them in your hand and today whatever you need wherever you're at just tell God God if you're needing healing today, just tell God, God, you're my healer today. If you're needing deliverance, maybe something is, is plaguing you, maybe it's something that's addictive, say, God, you're my redeemer today. If you're feeling unloved today, say, God, you're my heavenly father that loves me and that wants the best for me. So we have some stations on the front and the back and on the sides. And would you bow your heads as I pray? Dear Lord, thank you. Thank you for bringing us together in your house, Lord, even through the storms today, uh, even through this week that we've had, God, Lord, we pray that as we have gathered here in your name, Lord, you, you promise that you are with us. And God, when we feel like you're furthest away from us, that's when you're so close to us. So, Lord, as we take that cup of juice that represents your blood and that piece of bread, that's your body. Lord, may we declare who you are. And as we've been singing about the promises that you have given us, that you have spoken, and everything you speak comes into existence. Lord, we love you. We thank you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Will you come?
backing down from any giants Cause I know, I know how the story ends Yes, I know how the story ends I'm gonna see you victory So, man, I'm so glad that you guys swam in this morning. Thanks. Or rode in or whatever you did. Um, When you guys hear, I don't even know if it still applies now. We probably got taken care of, but just in case. When you guys hear somebody say, I got good news and I got bad news. Do you want the good news or the bad news first? Who wants the bad news first? All right. Who wants the good news first? (laughs) <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> bad news first. All right, bad news is, and at least may have been taken care of, but at least earlier today, the owner of a blue Honda with a license plate 976XCH left your lights on in the front parking lot of the church. Good news is your windows were up. <laughs> so you can figure out which one works for you, okay? Man, I, I love what God's been to 27 baptisms last month and off to a good start this month. Off to, <laughs> and here's the cool thing. Here's the cool thing. We've had two baptisms today. Both of them were named Nevaeh. 
which is heaven spelled backwards if you haven't figured out, okay? So that was like, that's pretty cool. That's pretty cool today. And I don't know, you guys have been here this whole series, but um, two weeks ago, two weeks ago, Jason was preaching and he dropped a truth bomb that was maybe the single greatest um, sermon analogy I've ever heard in my life. When he was talking about the difference between snorkeling and scuba diving. If you were here, I hope you caught that, all right? And if you weren't here, listen, because snorkeling is on the surface, right? And scuba diving is diving deeper and getting down under the water. And, and they're both really cool. I've snorkeled before. I've never scuba dived. But I've snorkeled. It's cool, man. They're like, when you get to swim around, especially if you're in a good, you wouldn't go snorkeling if you weren't in a good place. Like Kentucky River, snorkeling. No, no, probably not going to happen. All right. But like when you're in a cool place and you get to swim around, you, that's, that's cool. That's cool. I can't imagine how cool it would be to, to dive deeper and to see. And if that's true of snorkeling and scuba diving, how much greater is it when we dive deep into a relationship with Jesus Christ than just skim along the surface? But here's what Satan wants to do. Satan wants to distract us. He wants to distract us with surface level beauty so we won't go deep enough to see the real stuff. He wants to distract us when, when it's raining outside and so I probably can't go to church. He wants to distract us when like the sermon, and like I, I'll be honest with you, I, the last two weeks of not preaching, I got to listen, but also to observe. And I got to observe, you know what I observed last week? <laughs> like Jason was like all over it all over it and and God was using it but here's the thing I know Jason and I, so I know he was aiming for your heart but apparently he was getting some toes because because here's what happens and Satan is Satan will distract you into believing that like right in the middle of a, of a message when like it's like really like this this is the moment Satan will convince you you need to go to the restroom he'll do it every time he'll do it every time and you'll get up and you'll walk out and everybody in the room will start looking at you. Now, now, now nobody ain't walking out today, right? <laughs> Mission accomplished. All right. but, but that's how Satan wants to distract us. He wants to use little things to distract us. But I just want to tell you that in the middle of what he means to distract us, God can still work to his good. And God can still make a difference in people's lives. So we've been talking about diving deeper. We've been talking about that. Oh, I, I almost forgot. I got to tell you this because we got to celebrate for a minute. Remember the little egg carton boxes that were up here and they were out there? Uh, we, we finally counted the change. My arms are sore from carrying the buckets to the bank to pour them into the machine. But we collected in change this year $4,363 that, that went to Haiti. And I, I don't, I'll, I'm going to put it in the e-news this week. I can't remember. They sent me a thing that bought like 20 some thousand eggs uh, for kids in Haiti uh, to help them. So that was really, that was really a cool thing. I meant to tell first service and I forgot. So anyway, this series, the first way we talked about growing with each other. Then Jason talked to us about caring for each other. And then he talked to us about praying for each other. But this week, I'm, we're going to have to dive deep into what I kind of think may be the hardest one to live out of all of them, and that's holding each other accountable. And we struggle with that one so bad. Here's why we struggle. We have, we have become a nation that anytime somebody not even just in the church, but just in general, anytime somebody points out something that you or a group of people may be doing incorrectly or completely wrong, the immediate response is, you can't judge me. We even go and quote the great theologian Tupac, only God can judge me. <laughs> well, Tupac had that right. One thing he understood, only God can judge me. The part that he didn't understand is, and he will. Better sit in that for a little bit, all right? But, but holding each other accountable, I don't want to do that. I might hurt your feelings. Or you know, stay in your, you know, we, we quote things like, stay in your own lane and all this like, and we've missed out on 
one of the greatest things that God tells us to do. Jason told us uh, in the very first week that there were 59 one another's. 59 different one another's in Scripture. And he pointed out how many times the Scripture says to love one another. And there's a bunch. There's a bunch of those. But do you know the second most one another in Scripture is to hold each other accountable. They go hand in hand. That if I really do love you, I'm willing to point out things that are out of line because I'm also hoping you'll point them out to me. See, that's what accountability is. It's a two-way street. But we get caught up in this, you know, you can't judge me. You can't judge me. Well, I can't condemn you, but I can judge your actions. Do you know how many judgments you already made today? At least several I can think of. Because when you were driving in here today, first of all, you made the judgment to get out of the house when it was raining and storming. Way to go, all right? Cool judgment, all right? But here's one that you didn't even really consider, but that you were making a judgment. As you were coming here today, you made a judgment that every time that little red ball up in the sky went to red instead of green, you decided to stop. You made a judgment. And you also trusted that the people coming the other direction were going to make the same appropriate judgment. Or if you didn't have a red light, you had an eight-sided sign that told you. And you made a judgment to stop. And you trusted that everybody else coming the other way was going to do the same thing when it was their turn. You make judgments all the time. Those, those, are, those are necessary. You, you, you go out to eat today after lunch and the meal's really, really good. Really, like, really, like, on fire. Good. You're probably going to make a judgment, I'll go back. Or if the meal is cold and you don't get good service and you feel like you paid too much, there's another judgment, right? You're going to make a judgment. I ain't going back here ever again, all right? See, judgments are part of life, but there's a difference between a judgment of a situation and a condemnation, all right? Because Jesus clearly does tell us that the second is not right. And so we need to define accountability and judging properly based on biblical worldview, biblical viewpoint. Yes, judging each other's actions in a condemning way, no, no. But making judgments, oh, that's not right. That's not right. That may be exactly why God put you there at that time, to make that judgment. See, Christ judging, Christ field judging is looking and another person's actions in such a way that you're not pronouncing guilt as if you are the uh, judge, jury, and executioner, but yet you're just someone that cares. Because Jesus said things about it. Jesus did say, judge not that you be not judged. He was talking about condemnation. Jesus told the people that brought the woman caught in the act of adultery, those of you without sin, cast the first stone. Because they were wanting to condemn her to death, and so that judgment was a condemnation, not come on, sweetheart, you don't need to live this way. So you can look at the same action and you can judge it in a biblical way or you can judge it in a non-biblical way. And Jesus judged it in a biblical way and then told her to quit doing what she was doing. Don't go back to doing that anymore. And then stop. And, and, and both our judgments, we got to make sure we make the right judgment. See, Jesus' point in all this is to show the hypocrisy of those who thought they could judge others. In fact, they were guilty themselves. They had the plank sticking out of their eye when they were picking a speck out of someone else's instead of just saying, we gotta live right. So what we wanna start off this morning is let's look at scripture. Let's look right at scripture and understand scripture and understand our role. Because first and foremost, we gotta understand we're not creating biblical principles here. We're sharing them. There's a difference between the two. You see, when people try to add stuff that's not in here, they're creating principles. That's not what we try to do. Here, if when, you're done, when we're done here today, we, we're blessed. We've got so many law enforcement officers that are part of our church, and we pray for them on regular. But here's what, if they're out there, and when we leave here today, and you're going down the highway about 25 miles faster than you're supposed to be, an hour faster than you're supposed to be, and they come up and with the blue lights and pull you over, guess what? The penalty, the penalty has already been established. 
a certain speed over the speed limit, here's your fine. Boom, 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 boom. So many times of doing that, here, give us your license. That judgment, the, the, the penalty, the, that part of the judgment, all that's left to doubt is guilt or innocence. And, and that's the way it is for every, every law that we have. And so in God's word, there are judgments that have already been established long, long ago. And when you or I decide that we're going to be willing to hold each other accountable, all we're doing is sharing what God has already done and said, okay? That takes a lot of the pressure off. Because, yeah, if you're making up the rules and you decide to make one harder on me than on somebody else, I'm, I'm not happy with that. But if all you're doing is sharing, and here's what God's word says. There's a train coming down the tracks of eternity that if you don't get off those tracks, it's going to run you over. And you don't push me off those tracks, you don't love me. You don't care enough. You don't care enough. But if you, get, if you do whatever it takes to get me off the tracks, you're sharing a, an impending doom and you're trying to keep me from falling into that impending doom. Here, Paul, was t Paul wrote so many letters in the New Testament. He wrote one of them, to, or two of them actually, to a guy named Timothy, who's getting ready to go lead this church in a place called Ephesus. It was a good church, but they had, man, they were messed up on a lot of things. And in 2 Timothy, look what he says here. He says in verse 3, he says, all scripture is God-breathed, First of all, notice it's God breathed, not Dave breathed, not Jason breathed, not elders of any church breathed. All scripture is from God, right? Okay. And it's useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness so that the, who, the servant of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. Notice, notice these four things it says in the middle. First of all, it's God breathed, but here's what you can use it for. First of all, for teaching. That's, God's word's good for teaching. Notice it doesn't say it's good for studying. Uh-oh. See, some of you love to study the Bible. Some of you have got multiple Bibles. Some of you have got multiple study Bibles. And some of you read not only the verse for the day, but you read every note in the bottom of the page for everything. And you study. You study. You take it in. It doesn't say it's useful for studying. It said it's useful for teaching. You need to study to teach, but if you study and study and study and you learn all that stuff and you never get wrung out, you're no good. You're just a soggy sponge that can't soak up anymore until you get wrung out. God's word is useful for teaching. That's part of accountability. You know more than I do? Teach me. Teach me. Don't keep all that to yourself. Teach me. Teach me. All right? It's also good for rebuking. Rebuking. Every parent in here has practiced that one. We, uh, we love to practice that one. We're like, get in line. Get in line. Okay, but we're supposed to. We're supposed to point out, hey, no, you can't do that. No, you can't do that. You can't do that. All right? But look at the next one, and correcting. It doesn't do us any good to point out wrong if we don't point out right. If we don't steer the ship in the right direction. You know, it, it didn't do any good for somebody to yell at the captain of the Titanic, hey, there's an iceberg out here. Somebody needed to say, you need to correct the direction. You need to miss the iceberg. And a lot of us are seeing icebergs in our life and we're running right into them because nobody's helping us correct the direction in our life. And we don't realize it's about to puncture a hole in us that's going to take us down. It's also good for training in righteousness. Training in righteousness. That Here, I want to coach you. I want to coach you. You know, and I think I've said this in here before, in all the years that on the side I've helped coach athletics, you know the hardest athletes to coach are ones that were taught wrong when they were little? If they were taught to shoot a basketball the wrong way, it's next to impossible to reteach that. If they were taught to swing a certain way at a baseball, it's almost impossible to reteach that. The easiest way to teach is if we start training the right way from the beginning. That's why our children's ministry is so important. That's why our student ministry is so important because we need to help uh, not do it for parents, but we need to help parents train from the jump start, 
Train from the beginning. Train to get things going so that they can know how to live. So that every servant of God, that's the people we're helping to hold accountable, may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. I told you that there are a lot of passages in the Bible about caring for, about holding each other accountable. I don't have time to read them all, but a bunch of them are going to pop up here. Five or six are going to pop up one right after another, okay? The first one's from the book of Galatians, chapter 6. It says, dear brothers and sisters, notice there's a familial connection there, brothers and sisters, hang on to that, we'll come back to that, brothers and sisters. If another believer, notice the connection there, if another believer is overcome by sin, you who are godly should gently and humbly help that person back on the right path. And be careful that you don't fall into the same temptation. Notice some things there. Brothers and sisters, hold another believer. See, this is, here, get, the, get ready for this. This is, this is critically important. We are not called to hold the pagan world accountable. God will take care of that one. We are called to hold each other accountable, brothers and sisters accountable. And, and you know, if, if a person's not a believer in King Jesus, why would they listen to anything that King Jesus has to say? And so we hold each other accountable. Next thing, James chapter 5, verse 16. This is Jesus' half-brother. We'll get back to talking about that some more in a minute, too. But he says this, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. The earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. This is so cool that James is Jesus' half-brother and who didn't believe in Jesus until after the resurrection. And then in James chapter 5, he, he has such a golden nugget of a section on the power and the importance of prayer. And if you are sick, you need to call the elders and have them pray over you. You need to call one another. You need to confess sins and pray with you because the prayer of a righteous person is a powerful and effective tool. And for the, pro the problem we have in the church today and a lot of Christians is we've got power saws, but we're not plugging them into electricity. And if you want to see something foolish, you go home and get a power saw and try to use it without plugging it into the power source. Guess what you do? You work twice as hard and you get nothing accomplished. And that's how a lot of us are praying. We're praying without the power source. We're not connecting to the Holy Spirit and letting God do that, okay? Look at the next one here. Look at the next one here. This is a long one. This is right from Jesus. And this is what happens if somebody does something to you. It says, if another believer, notice we're, once again, we're dealing with believers. If another believer sins against you, you go privately and point out the offense. And if the other person listens and confesses it, you've won that person back. Way to go. Mission accomplished. All right? That's great. But if somebody is out of line, who go? You go. You go. And, and let me... Let me point out, it doesn't say you text. You want to have a conversation with somebody about something serious like that? Do not text them. Do not text them because, you know, I've got good friends that haven't figured out yet that if you text me something in all caps, you're yelling at me. We learned that, but we haven't figured that out. No, you go to them. And, and, and if you are successful, if they confess it, then great, man, move on. But if you are unsuccessful, take one or two others with you and go back again so that everything you say may be confirmed by two or three witnesses. None of this he said, she said, all that kind of stuff that gets messed up. No, we're going to talk about this. And then if the person still refuses to listen, take your case to the church. And then if he or she won't accept the church's decision, which is a biblical decision, which this is Jesus, King Jesus telling us to do this. Treat that person as if they are a pagan or a corrupt tax collector because they're not doing what King Jesus says. Does that all make sense? 
It's like, if you say you're going to follow him, follow him. And if you're not willing to come under the authority of the church that he put here, and you're not willing to do things the right way that he said to do it, then you're not really a follower anyway. So you have in yourself become a pagan. That makes sense? Because if we're going to follow him, we're going to follow him. We don't get to pick and choose. I like that one. I like that one. Because I can hold that one against Joe down the street. No, they all count. And they count for Joe down the street, and they count for us. All right? All of what he said is relevant in authority. In James chapter 5, verse 19, look what it says. My dear brothers and sisters, if someone among you wanders away from the truth and is brought back, you can be sure that whoever brings the sinner back from wandering will save that person from death and bring about the forgiveness of many sins. Hmm. Hmm. If someone wanders away, but you bring them back, you have saved that person from death. Is it worth it? Is it worth it to hold people accountable? That's what's at stake. That's what's at stake. So yeah, it, we've got to be willing, and sometimes they're tough conversations, aren't they? Sometimes they're unpleasant conversations. How much do you care? Do you care enough to be uncomfortable a little bit? Last thing, here, last one of these, and then we'll move on. Jesus said in Luke chapter 17, so watch yourselves. If another believer sins, rebuke that person. And then if there is repentance, then forgive them. Even if the person wrongs you seven times a day, and each time turns again and asks forgiveness, you must forgive them. What? Are you kidding me? They keep doing it and keep asking for forgiveness, and I... And I got to forgive them again. Are you kidding me? Yeah. You have to. Here's what you don't have to do. You don't have to trust them. You don't have to trust Because forgiveness is free. Trust has to be earned. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hands because that gets embarrassing. But I bet that at least somebody in here, when you were like a teenager and started driving, had that brain cramp and did something stupid, and dad said, give me the keys. Give me the keys. And you got them back. How'd you get them back? You re-earned the trust. They didn't quit loving you. In fact, they love you enough not to let you kill yourself and somebody else. Give me the keys. And then you earn the trust back by the way that you lived, all right? so. We need to understand why this is so important. Now, this, get, this gets a little bit hairy right here. I'm really getting kind of tired of hearing people talk about how bad the world has gotten. Do you know there's never been a single thing that's happened in the history of this world that caused God in heaven to go, didn't see that coming. <laughs> and the majority of what happens shouldn't shock us because his word, his word has warned us of that. And when, when Paul's writing this letter to Timothy, he says, a time is coming when people will no longer listen to sound and wholesome teaching. Duh. <laughs> like, yeah. And they will follow with their own desires, their own desires, and will look for teachers who will tell them whatever their itching ears want to hear. They will reject the truth and chase after myths. It's like when, you're, when your teenager comes to you and says, hey, mom, can I go wherever, whatever, and you say no, and then you get the crocodile tears or the tantrum or whatever it is like that, and then you look around and they've gone to dad. Dad, can I go? You know what they're trying to do? They're trying to find someone or tell them what their itching ears want to hear. Yeah, you can go. Dads, if you're the second one in that chain, never say yes. Just that's good. That's advice coming up for Mother's Day and Father's Day, okay? Here's what Paul told Timothy. This stuff's going to happen. But why are we so surprised? And, and, and not only that, not only why are we, why do we continue to back down? As individuals and as, as a group of believers, a community of believers, why do we continue to back down? 
You know, so many times, I, like, I'll be in a situation that happened to me just a couple weeks ago. It's in a situation, and I'm talking about things that were wrong, and what ought to be right, and ought to do this, and okay, yeah, here, we're going to stand on what is right. But we don't want to say too much, because we don't want to poke the bear. I couldn't take it anymore. I'm getting kind of sick of being the bear. I'm getting kind of sick of the church and Christ followers being the bear. And the poking keeps coming. And we turn into teddy bears instead of the grizzly bear that God created the church to be, to stand firm for truth. And we got to stand firm for truth. But we got to do it in love. See, if we can practice truth and grace, we can do it. I can tell you, you know, that lifestyle that you're choosing to live, I can look at you and I can say, that's wrong. That's wrong. Not because I said so, but because God said so. I can tell you that and say, now, come on, let's hug it out. If I care about you, I can love you and still say, no, that's wrong. That's wrong. We've got to be willing to do that. We've got to understand why that is so important. And, and we've got to understand, as it said a minute ago, it's between brothers and sisters. See, there are certain people in our life that we trust enough that they can say stuff to us and we can say stuff to them. And we're still good. And we're still good. There are some people in my life that I may not agree with them, but they can say whatever they want to me. And I'm going to listen. Because the friendship has been far too long for me to ignore. We need those people in our lives that will hold us, hold us accountable as we hold others. So we need to understand what is happening has been foretold, okay? I want to take you to one more, one more book of the Bible. It's written by Jesus' other brother that wrote part of Scripture. His name is Jude. It's in the very back of your Bible. It's right before you get to the book of Revelation. It's only got one chapter. It's like a postcard, all right? And, and Jude, this is so important to understand because James and Jude were, were half-brothers. They were Joseph and Mary's sons where Jesus was God and Mary's son, all right? But they grew up in the same house. They watched it, and they didn't really believe in all the stuff that they were saying about Jesus until after, until three days after they watched him die on a cross, and then they saw him up and walking, and all of a sudden that changed their belief system, all right? Right? And they became leaders in the church after that, okay? And Jude writes this letter to the church, and in verse 17, he says this. He says, it sounds just like what Paul had told Timothy. But you, my dear brothers, my dear friends, must remember the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ predicted this. They told you that in the last times there would be scoffers whose purpose in life is to satisfy their ungodly desires. These people are the ones who are creating divisions among you, and they follow their natural instincts because they do not have God's spirit living in them. If you compare those two things, that what Jude said to what Paul had said, it's like their itching ears want to hear what they want to hear so they can justify their actions. I just want somebody to tell me it's okay. I just want somebody to tell me it's okay. I don't care if I'm at work and everybody in the whole building thinks I'm wrong. If I can find one person, one person that will tell me they agree with me, they're right. we're right, the rest of them are wrong. I just, I just need somebody. Just need somebody to justify what I'm doing. Man, you can find somebody to justify anything. I'm just saying. Just saying. Their itching ears want to hear what they want to satisfy their desires. That's what I want. That's what I want. You know, when, when they're coming back and forth, when the kids are coming back and forth to mom and then to dad and back and forth, and get, here's what they do, right? See this played out? I went to mom. She said no. I went to dad. He said no. Poppy. Just somebody, somebody say it's okay so I can satisfy, do what I want to do. They want to fulfill their own cravings, the Bible says, follow their cravings. But see what it does? This is why I was saying earlier, if you're the second one on that rotation, never say opposite of what the first one did. Because look what the Bible said, they're creating divisions. Because when this person says, now you can't do that. And this person, ah, go ahead. Messed up. One of the things that I, I don't, 
I don't tip, I'm, I'm not a great counselor in the first place because I'm pretty much like in your face. Um, and, and so like, you know, if you, you want the loving pat on the back, I'm probably not your guy. But, um, but I never counsel somebody that's getting counseling from somebody else. Too much opportunity for me to say something completely opposite. And we both, we both might be right. But then it creates confusion and division. And so, like you talk to somebody else, great, keep them. Are they, are they Christians? Do they follow the Bible? Yeah, great, super. Keep following them. I'm out. Call me if you need me. You know, but not to counsel. Because I don't want to cause confusion in the household. All right? All right? And so, it's important to understand why we do this as foretold. It's important to understand that our goal is to build each other up. Verse 20 says this, But you, dear friends, must build each other up in your most holy faith, pray in the power of the Holy Spirit. Because all of us have got to give an account to God someday, right? Paul was, Paul was accurate when he said, Here's the deal. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and the wages of those sin is death. That's it. That's it. Everybody's on board with that or in that picture, in that story. But here's what Jesus did that was so amazing, that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Christ died for us. And when, when Jesus died on the cross, he took the sins of the entire universe on his back, and none of them were his. You talk about paying off a debt. And then he said this, he said, hey, when that bill comes due, I got you. I, got, I already paid it. I already paid it. We're good. See, we gotta, what we're trying to do when we hold each other accountable is we're trying to build each other back up and make sure that we're in good stand with the one who has paid our debt. And so that when we all stand before the Father, that, that our advocate, the son who paid our debt is saying, hey, this one's with me. This one's with me. And then we've got to understand mercy and await the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will bring you eternal life. In this way, you will keep yourself safe in God's love. You must show mercy to those whose faith is waving, wavering. Rescue others by snatching them from the flames of judgment. Show mercy to still others, but do so with great caution, hating the sins that contaminate their lives. And then here's the best part. When we do all that, here's, the, here's how he ends this, this little letter. He says, catch this out, you got to understand the reward. He says, now, now all glory to God who is able to keep you from falling and will bring you with great joy <clears throat> into his glorious presence without a single fault. Am I the only one in here that's got some faults? You got that whole list? You got that whole list? And to know that whatever, however long your list is, even if it's only one thing on your list or if it's a thousand things on your list, that because of Jesus Christ, you get to stand before his father someday without fault. That's pretty amazing. That's stinking amazing. And if you haven't accepted that, what are you waiting for? You might stand before him tonight. What are you waiting for? All glory to him who alone is God, our Savior through Jesus Christ our Lord. All glory, majesty, power, and authority are his before all time, in the present and beyond all time. Amen. Let me give you a real quick formula because you're like, okay, I'm bought in. I want to, how, how should I do this accountability thing? All right. Here, here's let me give you four things real quick. The first thing you got to do is define. You got to define what is it that you're like, you can't just be like picking on people. All right. It's not just a matter of like, I don't like the way you are. No, you know, what, what's the issue here? What's the problem here? What's not the right way? And you got to define what it is that you're trying to hold somebody accountable for. And you got to figure out how you're going to best communicate. Remember we said best communication is one-on-one, -on -one. go to that person, then take a witness, and then take more witnesses than need to. And it's not text messaging. It's not instant messaging. It's not, definitely not putting something on Instagram. It's like face-to-face, -face, like we're going to communicate. Here, we got a problem here. We're going to fix this out. We're going to work this out. And then you assess and identify what the best solution is. I'm not just going to tell you, like, here's where you're wrong. I'm going to tell you, here's, where, here's, where, here's the way it ought to be. And the last thing, you're going to follow through. You're going to follow through. I'm not just going to leave it hanging out there. And here's why. Here's why. Because when you know that you belong to God, you're accepted. You've got an acceptance in your life that you don't have to prove anything anymore. 
He, you have accepted him, and he has accepted you. And that makes it a whole lot easier to live. And that you know that he wants to be with you. There's an affection for you. That's the thing about all this. God did all this. He created us in, in the very beginning. And then when he saw that we messed up, he figured out a way. Because from Genesis 3 all the way through today, he's been bringing us back because he wants to be with us. Because there's an affection that's there for us. And, and when you know that, when you know that, you know that he, that you have found, he finds pleasure in you and you find pleasure, that you have his approval. You know how many young people are dying for someone's approval? And I'm guessing it's not just young people. That There's probably some of us adults that are sitting in here that spend far too much time trying to win someone's approval. And we know that we've already got God's approval. It's a game changer. And then we know that we're accepted and we're loved, cared for, there's affection and we've got approval and that he sees and he hears us. In other words, he's paying attention. <laughs> Remember when you're sitting at home and you're trying to read something and the little one, I mean the little ones, and they start talking and you're like, give me a second, give me a second. You know, what do they do? They give you a second, right? No, they don't. They talk louder. They, they're trying to get your attention. And when you know that you've got the Holy Father's attention, it makes it a whole lot easier to accept his accountability when you've got these things. If I know I'm accepted and I know I'm, I've got affection, I'm loved, and I know I've got his approval and I've got his attention, then, okay, hold me accountable to how I'm supposed to live my life. And here's the bottom line. Here's why we do this. Because if we're going to become fully devoted disciples, we need each other to go deeper with Jesus. Because scuba diving alone can be very dangerous. You can get in a world of trouble when you're down deep and it's dark. You don't need to be down there alone. Here's how we're going to finish today. In just a minute, I'm going to pray. Stu and Todd are going to come out, and Stu will just sing a little bit in the background. But it's really, as soon as I'm done praying, uh, we're just going to challenge you to to look at yourself and look at your relationship and take this stuff and hold yourself accountable a little bit and kind of go wrestle some. And so I'm going to pray while they're playing and they'll sing a little bit. But at that point, we can just get out of here and go love God and love people and watch him change the world. God, thanks for loving us enough to give us Jesus. Thanks for loving us enough to hold us accountable. Help us to love you and to love our neighbors and our friends and the people that are in our circles enough to be willing to be held accountable but to hold others accountable so that we can all get to the end of this journey and be able to hear well done good and faithful servant enter into your reward because in the end it's worth it all in the end we already know that because of the blood of Jesus Christ, we get to see a victory. Help us to do that and to live that this week. In Jesus' name, amen. Love God, love people. Watch him change.